Welcome, everyone. My name is Mark McPeak, and I'm a past president of the American Society of Naturalists, and I'd like to welcome you to the AMNAT presidential address. <clears throat> it's my honor to introduce Mike Whitlock this morning. <clears throat> Mike is professor of zoology at the University of British Columbia, and Mike is an internationally renowned geneticist and evolutionary biologist who's equally adept at as being a theoretician and an empirical biologist, which is a very rare feat. Mike got his um, bachelor's degree at, the, at Baylor University, got his PhD at Vanderbilt University, then took a, I don't know what this was, a postdoc at the, as a loose scholar in Indonesia. Then he had postdocs at the University of Chicago and in Edinburgh University and then took a faculty job at UBC. Mike is a fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also apparently the editor for all of our evolution and genetics journals, having served on the editorial board of Heredity, Evolution, Journal of Evolutionary Biology, Genetics Research, Ecosphere, Ecology and Evolution, and the Annual Review of Ecology and Systematics. He also has served Yeoman's work for the American Society of Naturalists and for the American Naturalists, first as an editor of the journal and then as editor-in-chief. He's also a past president of the American Society of Naturalists and today he is giving his presidential address as the 2019 president of the American Society of Naturalists. So let's welcome Mike. Thanks. Huh? That was awesome. Yeah. Um, I freaking love science. I like, I love doing science. I love hearing about science. I love learning things from science. One of the things that I love most about science is that we're not sure about stuff. That we embrace doubt. We embrace uncertainty. We know we get things wrong. That means we get second and third chances at things. That's not what you always get in life. Uh, when, um, you know, we, we're proud of our humility in the face of data in science. And so what I want to do today is to um, explore this aspect of science, this uncertainty, this doubt that we um, that we, that we carry forward. You know, we spend a lot of time trying to quantify uncertainty in science. We take entire courses in statistics, we write textbooks in statistics, we spend hours and hours agonizing over what the right way to analyze our data is, all to try to discover what's the chance that we got a wrong answer or an answer that's an error in some way caused by the chance effects of sampling. And that's great. That's, we're way ahead of some other fields in the, in the degree and sophistication that we do that. But that's not the only source of error in science. That's not the only reason why somewhere along the process from somebody having an idea, doing a project, analyzing the data, writing up the paper, sending it out to a journal, and it reaches your eyeballs as a reader, that's not the only way something could have gone wrong. And so what I want to do today is um, spend a little bit of time thinking about what can go wrong, and more importantly, trying to quantify of those things that might go wrong, how likely are they? And there's a literature of this that I want to share with you today. Okay, so why, did I, why do I want to talk about this? Well, a couple of motivations for doing this talk. One of them is this, and honestly, this is really what got me thinking about this topic 20 years ago. So Kevin Fowler, wonderful guy, University of College London, and uh, he and I did some huge experiments together, and at the end of one of them, we analyzed the data, and for one of the questions, ta-da, the p-value was, 10 to the minus 253. Now, 
If you write that out, that's a lot of zeros uh, <laughs> for the p-value. And just to amuse ourselves, we said, well, if you did it the usual way of adding asterisks, for, uh, uh, that's how many asterisks it would take to represent that kind of result. And so I got to say, when we first saw this result, our first reaction was, damn, we're good, right? <laughs> And then reality started to creep in. My next reaction was, well, hang on, wait a minute. 10 to the minus 253, there's 10 to the 80 part of fundamental particles in the entire universe. So if every one of those particles was composed of an entire universe of 10 to the 80 particles, and each of those particles was composed of 10 to the 80 particles, uh, and then you multiply it times 10 trillion, that's what it takes to get up to... 10 to the 253, one over that number. That's a, that's a tiny, tiny number. And you gotta think, oh, well, all right, maybe that's the, really the chance of a sampling error giving us this result, but there's so many other things that have to be more likely than that, right? The, the chance that just some quantum superposition move the zeros and ones in my computer and change the answer is probably greater than this number. Um, the chance that I did my stats wrong is certainly bigger than this number. That I, that I transposed the columns, that, that some villain snuck into my office and changed the computer file around, that some technician didn't understand exactly what we were doing and wrote the numbers down wrong, et cetera, something, right? All those things, as unlikely as you might think they are, are far more likely than this p-value. And so, it made me start wondering, what are the chances of these other sources of problems? And uh, how do we view our statistical results in that context? Another motivation for this talk is, is, is more recent. Uh, over the last decade, there's been a lot of discussion in the uh, other areas of science, particular medicine and psychology, about a replication crisis particularly psychology, has had a real issue with this. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, stories in the press, both the scientific press and the uh, popular press, about this replicability issue. And so this made me start to wonder, should we be having a reproducibility crisis ourselves? Uh, what, what, what do you know about this? Okay, so that's the context. Um, what I want to do today is... Um, I want to talk about how can science go wrong. Uh, and by the way, I, when I list the things that go wrong, every one of these things are something, we, we know these things can go wrong. Everybody in here, I'm not telling you something new about that. What I want to um, do that might be a little more novel to you is try to synthesize some of the literature about these errors to quantify the rates at which they might occur so we can know perhaps more about how, to, how often to worry about them. And then finally, hopefully, make some suggestions about what we can do about it. Okay, so as I said, we spent a lot of effort quantifying statistical errors. Uh, these occur when the sample, by chance, gives an answer different from the truth. In, in some sense, there's, there's always a statistical error. We never get exactly the right answer. Uh, but uh, we spent a lot of effort trying to quantify the rate of those. But as we've mentioned, chance is not the only source of error in our answers. Uh, there could be fraud, where somebody made up the data, made up the conclusion. There could be an error made by the statistician or somewhere else during the analysis of the data, including perhaps uh, because they used the wrong model to analyze the data. Now, there could be an, a, a problem with the experimental design. There could have been something that went wrong technically during the course of the experiment that uh, meant what you thought happened methodologically is not actually what happened. Uh, there could be an error in communicating the result to the, uh, to, to other scientists, because science really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the individual scientist knows. It matters what we collectively know, and what we, what most of what we know about science comes from other people. So if we fail at communicating, that error is just as significant as failing at any of these other stages. And finally, uh, there's a huge problem, and I'll, I'll argue it's one of our biggest problems, in that we have a bias in what we publish and what we don't. So how often do these things occur? Well, studies of scientific error are not that common in ecology and evolution. There's some, 
I'll try to, I'll, I'll talk about some of them as we go. But there's a broad literature across science. Okay, so I'm, I'm not gonna particularly focus on ecology evolution, our fields here today, uh, in part because that opens up a, a, a much broader literature, for, sometimes for reasons that will become clear later. Um, but also, I don't wanna call out anybody in the room per se, right? I mean, this, so don't worry if, if you know you've done this. I, I'm not, okay. And, but before I start, <clears throat> I wanna just give you a warning. It's kind of, this is the meta part of the talk. Uh, critiques of science are a lot more publishable than, uh, than when somebody finds that everything happened just fine, right? So uh, there's a very good chance that the numbers I'm going to show you are in error exactly in the same way that I'm talking about things being in error uh, in the science that they're talking about. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's work our way through that list. Let's start with fraud. This is one that gets a lot of attention. Fraud is something that's extremely consequential to science because of the reputation of science is hampered when fraud happens. I, um, but let me clarify uh, in a way I should have done before. My, my task here today, my goal at least, is not to try to say everything that scientists can do wrong. More, I, what I'm trying to do is more precisely say, if you see a particular result, what's the chance that that result is an error? Okay? So I'm, I'm not talking about all other kinds of misconduct. And I'm not talking about the other negative consequences of some of these things on science as a whole or the people involved in science. I'm very interested in finding what's the chance that when you see a result that it's actually not true. Okay, so that's going to zoom in on that focus. And from that perspective, fraud is not our biggest problem. Okay, it's hard to get precise quantification of how often fraud happens. Uh, but there's been several surveys, and the largest one is the one that I give you results from here. Uh, three scientists out of a thousand will, on an anonymous survey, admit to falsifying da research data within the last three years. Okay, that's way higher than it should be. It's horrible. But it's not an enormous number, in as you'll see later compared to the other things we'll talk about. Not an enormous number in terms of the sources of uh, why something might be wrong. The similar surveys will say will show you that 14% of us are know of a case involving colleagues uh, about fraud, and that sounds like a high number. But until you put it in the context of, we all know lots of other scientists, and we're likely to hear about uh, cases of fraud that that you know we we will will drive the rumor mill. So uh, that I think is not actually a super high number either. Okay, so this is a problem. It's bad for science. As you'll see, this is the smallest number that we're gonna deal with uh, in terms of error. It's not what we gotta worry about. Okay, uh, statistician error. It's a crappy name for simply the fact that somebody did their stats wrong and the conclusion is not um, entirely supported by the statistical analysis. So a number of years ago, there was a study in the British Medical Journal uh, where a statistician took the uh, results in papers uh, sorry, took, the, took a series of papers from the BMJ and analyzed the statistical methodology in the paper itself. They didn't go back to the original data. All they have access to is the methodology as spelled out in the paper. And they discovered at least about half of those include at least one error in their statistics in some way. But more significantly, in 8% of the, of the papers, not of the errors, but 8% of the papers, the error was significant enough to change the conclusion of the paper. Okay, so... If you think that a 5% type one error rate is acceptable, that's our limit to how often we can get things wrong, we've, we've just blown that out of the water right off the gate, right? There's, there's a high probability of somebody making a statistical error. Um, there's a, a few more things that relate to errors of analysis. Uh, one, one thing I'll mention, this is the only slide where it relates to the work of our lab. This is from a, a paper by Katie Lauterhaus and I uh, from a few years ago. Uh, as models to analyze data become more and more complicated, uh, we become more and more disconnected from knowing what's actually in the statistical calculations. And in particular, uh, this example is uh, dealing with methods that look across the genome to find particular genes that are responsible for local adaptation, so-called genome scan. 
And what, what Katie and I showed is that these traditional methods for doing that, that's the different colors, um, have a uh, uh, extremely high, in some cases, false discovery rate. In other words, in some cases, uh, well over half of the time that you thought you found a significant result or you know, that you, you thought you found something that was uh, under local adaptation, that that was actually a false discovery, that there was not statistical support for it. And this comes from the fact that the models ignored the complexities of the demog demography and the, and the history of the populations. Um, not to get into the details of that, but that, as we get more and more sophisticated in our analysis, we're going to have more and more challenges like this where um, our real world doesn't match the assumptions of the analysis, and we don't always even know that that's a problem. Okay. Um, another kind of analysis error I think is potentially quite significant. Um, this is something called uh, uh, harking. So harking is a, hark is an acronym for hypothesizing after the results are known, right? You've got your data, you start to analyze the data and it helps you in the process of trying to understand what's going on, you generate hypotheses that you then treat as though they were a priori hypotheses and, and generate p-values as though it was a confirmatory statistical analysis. So harking, this is also called the researcher degrees of freedom or the forking paths. Uh, not deciding the specifics of your analysis uh, before, before you have the data in hand. Now, before I go, I mean, that in a way is something exactly that we want to do. We want to use our data to try to understand the world better. But the problem comes when we, when we tell a narrative where we have, as though we have an a priori hypothesis that was tested by that data. Um, and more than half of us um, admit to harking at least once, and, and usually it's not just the once category, but more often than once. Some people say almost always that they do that. The, the reason this is a problem is uh, there's a lot of ways that this can become a problem, but for example, you have a set of studies, or you've done a study, and it doesn't find a significant result, but then you notice, oh, but the males do the thing, but the females don't do the thing, or the females do the thing, but the males don't do the thing, or the things that um, happened early in the season do it, but the ones in the late season don't do it, or late season do it, the early ones don't, or the males do it early and the females do it late. Whatever. You, you can create more and more hypotheses, and some of those are gonna wind up being significant just by chance, and it, it generates a much higher type one error than we state uh, in the paper when we don't fully describe that process. Uh, this has been one of the big problems in psychology, as I understand it. Another analysis problem is coding errors. We're um, now doing more and more complicated statistics. Um, we're writing our own code to do this a lot. Uh, I can't find any estimates how, of how much error is created in science because of coding although there, there are some clear examples of where that's happened, we, there are estimates of how often there are coding errors in programs from professional programmers. It's on the order of uh, one to 5% of the lines in the code generate an error. That's professional programmers. If you listen to professional programmers who have looked at our code, they think it's probably a lot higher for us than them, and it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, a, a good example of this, a fairly uh, um, straightforward example of this, came from an, an economics paper that was the fundamental basis for the austerity measures in Europe. Um, they analyzed their data with Excel. One of the problems, one of the major problems that they had was that, it's hard to see here, but they, in, when they selected the column to analyze, they didn't fully drag it down uh, to include the whole data and it gave a different answer than it should have. It's just a simple analysis mistake. Okay, um, what I'll call experimental design error. There's a lot of different ways you can design your experiment that's bad. Uh, pseudo replication is one that we're all familiar with. Actually a lot of the statistical errors that I talked about before were the nature of pseudo replication. Uh, an another thing that we're quite bad at in our field is blinding where uh, we know what uh, treatment a particular individual belongs to when we um, measure the data, when we, treat, when we treat the individuals, when we analyze the data. Um, in the medical literature, it's been shown that studies that are carried out without double blinding exaggerated the treatment effects by an average of about 
there's higher estimates of this rate, too. There's some papers that say it's as high as 60%. So a, a major possible source of, of bias in our results is the lack of blinding. And in EEB, only about an eighth of the papers use blinding. It's not always possible, and, uh, but, but uh, we have to be aware of the fact that when we don't have blinded analysis or, or, or blinded data collection, that uh, we may be biasing the results, inadvertently, inadvertently, whatever. Okay. All right. Hello. All right. All right. Technical error <laughs> is the next thing. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is the one that I, that I think is very important, and I can find no documentation about how often it occurs, but I, I believe this is probably quite likely. What I mean by technical error is that what you decide is going to be the methodology, what you think is the methodology, is not exactly what happened. Something went wrong that you don't know about, and what you did to your study organisms is not what you thought you did to your study organisms. And I don't have an estimate for how often this occurs. I think it's probably relatively common. I'm going to just tell you a quick story uh, about this, uh, just as an illustration. Uh, several years ago, there was a paper in Science from a lab that reported the results of an experiment of giving uh, injections of MDMA, ecstasy, to monkeys. And so these poor monkeys then got sacrificed, and they looked at their brains. And in the brains, they had these lesions. And it was weird. It's not what anybody expected ecstasy would do to brains, but they were all over the place. And so they published a paper in Science about this. Uh, it uh, got picked up and used prominently in the uh, congressional tr uh, hearings the following year that led to the increased criminalization of ecstasy. It had, had real consequence in the real world. But then, you know, the, there was something about that paper that the authors didn't like. They'd given the monkeys injections of ecstasy, and that's not the way humans take it. And so they thought, well, let's do it again, but we'll give oral doses um, to make it more appropriate. And they went through the whole thing. More monkeys died, and uh, there were no lesions, nothing like the first time at all. To make a long story short, what had happened was they had gotten shipments of two vials of controlled substances at the beginning of that experiment. One was labeled MDMA, one was labeled methamphetamine. The labels were swapped on those two vials. What they had done in the original experiment was given the monkeys methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is well known to cause these kind of brain lesions. Okay? What's unusual to me about this story, and there's a lot more to this story, it's very interesting, but what's unusual, what's unusual to me about this story is not that they made a mistake. What's unusual is that they found it and uncovered what it was and then told us about it. And they, they retracted the paper the, the next year. Um, and I just have to um, show you this because uh, it shocked me. This is, the, this is the original paper on the science website. There is nothing up there that tells you that that paper was retracted. And it was absolutely unequivocally retracted. This did not happen as stated in the paper. And you can't tell that from, I mean, from, from looking at that page. That should not happen. OK, so I've, I've told you a number of these kind of, of errors that might go wrong. And some of the rates at which they occur are fairly high. Um, a lot of these kind of errors can be dealt with as a community. We can replicate results. And, if, and we often do replicate a number of times. And collectively, we can discover, oh, well, you know, on balance, there's evidence for this thing. Uh, you know, but some of these, uh, most of these mistakes that we're talking about here won't be made the second time. They're, they're, they're idiosyncratic, right? So if we replicate, we ought to be able to uncover these errors. And that, in fact, is how science moves forward. We know stuff. And we know stuff because we test what each other have done. In our field, that replication is used more often conceptual than, than true in the sense that we replicate the conceptual question maybe in a different organism or a different place as opposed to going back and doing exactly the same thing. So we have very little information about the error rates of, for particular organisms. 
But we have a lot of information usually about a, a, a particular concept in evolutionary ecology and how, how, how often that plays out. So the good news is that replication will solve a lot of the problems I've just talked about. But the problem is that replication only solves that problem if we have access to a fair representation of all the studies that have been done on a topic. And that's uh, what I want to challenge next, and that, that we don't have access to all of that. Um, there's a thing called publication bias, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I'll just illustrate it here with some simulated data. Um, what I've done here is I took a series of, of uh, uh, sample sizes, and that's sample sizes along the uh, x-axis here. Uh, I said, let's make there be a true effect size here of 0.05, okay? So that null hypothesis is false, but it's a weak effect. And then I just simulated drawing data sets of a particular size and show you the results uh, in terms of the estimate of the effect size for each of those studies, okay? So this is just, this is, uh, I know what the truth is. I've done this uh, by simulation. Okay, now I'm gonna show you in a minute the magnitude of publication bias, and I've used the numbers that I'll show you in a second to uh, uh, randomly decide which of these papers get published or not, okay? It turns out that the one in the literature, the papers that do not reach a standard of significance that don't have a low p-value are less likely to be published than ones that do have a low p-value. Okay, so if you apply that, if you apply that filter that, that creates the bias, you get uh, a number of the studies marked with the, X, the pluses here that are lost from our view because they don't get published. And then what we see is the pattern in the literature that looks like this, okay? It looks kind of okay, but what's missing here are a bunch of the studies that uh, didn't reject the null hypothesis, okay? Almost all of the ones that did are still there, including, in this case, one that rejected the null hypothesis in the opposite direction of the truth, right? There's about a 50% inflation of the effect size in this um, example uh, caused by this publication bias. Okay, this is not hypothetical. Uh, yeah. okay. It's not hypothetical. Uh, here is a, a similar funnel plot from uh, the, a paper by Rich Palmer where he uh, looked at the papers from Muller and Thornhill. Uh, these are papers that all look for whether there's an effect of fluctuating asymmetry, left-right asymmetry, on uh, the mating success of, of the individuals which, which are measured for their asymmetry. Here, the prediction is a negative relationship that, uh, oops, sorry, a negative relationship uh, that, that there should be less uh, mating success when you're more asymmetric. And that's, in fact, what most of the studies found. But if you look at this funnel plot, uh, well, all right, so the overall average of all the studies is marked here with this, with this uh, dashed line. These uh, solid curves mark off the boundaries where the p-value would be at 0.05, and outside that you reject it, inside you wouldn't. Um, we should see a cloud of points around that, if that were in fact the true effect size, we should see a cloud of points. Where that was the most likely place to see the data come in and be more spread out for small samples and less spread out for large. But for small samples, we see hardly any that are near that so-called putative true effect size. So there seems to be clear evidence of, of a publication bias for this particular case. Okay, well, that's a kind of evidence that we can use to say that publication bias works, these apparently missing studies. But we'd like to be do better than that. And fortunately, um, in the medical literature, we can. The, the problem with publication bias, both as an issue for science and in terms of studying it, is that we're missing a bunch of studies. We don't have access to those studies that didn't get published. Okay, in, in ecology and evolution, that's a real problem. We, it, it's not possible to track them all down. However, for certain kinds of science, like ones that involve human volunteers, you have to submit your study design to an ethical review panel before you do the work, and that gets recorded. And so there's been a number of studies, excellent studies, that have gone back to an ethical review panel, got a list of all the studies that um, were proposed, say five or 10 years ago, 
and then go back to the uh, people who, who submitted those proposals and say, you know, did you do the study? Uh, what did you find? What was the p-value? Did you publish it? Where did you publish it? How long did it take? You know, what happened to it, et cetera. So you, you track, uh, track the life history of, of, of studies that way. And when you do that, you find that studies that have a p-value less than 0.05 are 60% more likely to be published than papers that have a p-value greater than 0.1. Um, in that kind of death zone between 0.05 and 0.1, it's a further 60% uh, less likely to be published uh, when you're like, oh God, 0.06, what do I do with that? Uh, so there's a there's substantial publication bias. Uh, it's probably not as great as you would think from the fluctuating symmetry example, but that's, that's a huge source of bias in our estimates of uh, effects in the literature. Um, it's interesting, I think, to think about what, where this publication bias comes from more precisely. We, we all think it's editors that are doing this to us, and it's not. Only 5% of the unpublished papers with, with high p-values were submitted to journals and, re, and rejected there, right? 95% of the publication bias came from the researchers themselves not submitting the paper. Okay, so that's something we can all do something about. Um, also interesting, there's other correlates of publication bias. Uh, funding source is correlated when, when there's a uh, direct interest of the funder in the particular result that has much higher publication bias, such as drug companies funding science. Sample size has higher, uh, affects publication bias. There's much more publication bias in the sense of a difference between publication rates of high and low p-values. Much higher publication bias for small studies than for large. It's an incredibly useful fact. Large studies tend to be published anyway uh, that means they're more reliable to us as readers. Uh, and journal quality and quotes as indexed by either impact, impact factor or perceived quality by, by prominence, uh, the, the more prominent journals are, uh, have much higher publication bias than, 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 say, society journals, et cetera. Okay. I went to um, just along the lines of publication bias, it, it addresses a couple of the other things too, but there's a, just a super cool paper that I just want to tell you about and you should all go read. Uh, there was a paper, uh, it was in Science last year, and, and this is in the, uh, the, the, the wake of the replication cri crisis in psychology. They went through the last two years, uh, at a certain, two years of, of science and nature, found every paper that did an empirical study of psychology. Okay? For every one of those, and there was 21 of them, for all of those 21 papers, they picked one of the key results and then replicated that result. But not just replicated exactly what the original scientists done. What they did was say, okay, let's, let's imagine there's some inflation of the effect. So let's say that the effect size is really only half of the estimate in the paper, okay? So it's harder to detect. Uh, and let's say, let's do a study that has 90% power. So it's a 0.9 chance of being able to reject that uh, null hypothesis, if in fact the true effect size is only half as big as the original paper. So they've, they've, they've radically increased the power of the replicated study compared to the first one, but otherwise did everything the same as the, as the original study did. And here's what they found. Uh, here's those 21 studies. I've put them in order from uh, largest relative effect to smallest. Um, so the, the, the x-axis is not particularly meaningful. The y-axis is, is, is important to highlight. This is the relative effect size. In other words, how big was the effect in the replicated, replicate study compared to the original study? So at zero would mean there's no effect. One would mean they found exactly the same effect size in the replicate study as they did in the original study. And what you can see is there's only a couple that uh, had a larger effect, and not significantly so, from the original study. Uh, 19 out of 21 had a smaller effect. Uh, eight of the 21, 38% did not reject the null hypothesis in the replicate study in spite of the fact that it had a much higher power than the original. If you look at the overall effect size of all of these studies, it was dead on a half of the original studies on average. Right? So, uh, Studies published in prominent journals, when you replicate them with significant effort, uh, you find 
Yes, in fact, a lot of the things are true or supported by the, by the second study, but the magnitude of the effects on average is only half as big as it was. Okay. So that's a, a bias, not about yes or no is there an effect, but it's a strong bias in terms of how big is that effect. Very interestingly, they also surveyed uh, other psychologists and asked how likely did you think this particular effect uh, was, how much do you believe each of these effects? It was very strongly correlated with the ability to replicate. So the psychologists had a good sense about uh, what was and wasn't true, which I find very interesting too. Okay, so what do we do about all this? Well, I think a lot of the solutions come from the fact we're all here together. We're, science is a community effort. We, um, we make progress not individually, well, hopefully we do individually, but, but real progress in science comes through replication, cooperation, and open-mindedness about others' work and about our own uh, willingness to accept the possibility of error. So um, more concretely, what can we do in this community to, um, to make things a bit better? Uh, one thing that I think we should strongly consider is increasing our use of pre-registration of hypotheses and analyses. This is something that's become common in medical literature. It's, uh, it's been suggested in the psychology literature. Uh, the idea here is that before you've looked at the data, and hopefully before you have collected the data, you register electronically, at a third, uh, like, a, like a sealed envelope kind of thing, but register it electronically somewhere. Here's my hypothesis, and, and here's the covariates that I expect to matter for this hypothesis. If you think males should do a thing more than females, say that, right? If that's going to be the analysis, pre-register that hypothesis. This prevents this so-called harking. If you properly do pre-registration, at the end you say, okay, I said I was going to do this analysis, that's publicly available. Everybody can now see that that's what I said I was going to do. Here's that analysis. Here's the answer. Everybody knows that that bit of your work was a confirmatory data analysis where you did not change the rules as you went. Okay. I think, uh, so by pre-registering, we can distinguish in our papers what's a confirmatory data analysis and what's exploratory. Okay. Now, an important part about this is it doesn't prevent the exploratory analysis. It doesn't prevent anything that you currently do in your paper. Everything you do already, you can still do. You can still look at that data and say, oh, here's an idea that I never thought about now that I've, looked at, I've been in the field, I've done. You can still do all that. You can still generate new hypotheses. You can still talk about the way the data conforms to that hypothesis or not. But what it does is it, it gives you everything you currently have but it allows you to add value to your paper. It allows you to be able to publicly declare this part of the paper was a priori and I can prove it. Right? And if we do that, at least some of the results that we share, we cannot worry about parking as a possible source of error in those, in, in those results. Right? Uh, so this is something I think we should all think more about doing and we don't do it much at all now. I've never done it. What else can we do? Well, what can we do? I mean, the rest of this I'm gonna break down by different, our different roles. So as readers, what can we do about these errors in science? We read a paper, what do you wanna keep in mind? Well, one thing that we've seen is that larger studies are more reliable than smaller studies. Not only are the standard errors smaller just because large sample sizes are better than small for that, but they're more likely to be published in an unbiased way. If somebody's put all the effort into a large study, they tend to publish it and get something out of it regardless of what the result was. So we, we can rely on that more than we can smaller studies. We should value meta-analyses and, and the people who do them uh, because that, that's what generates our, our, our knowledge of how much replication there is about a topic. We should, in our minds and in our practice, emphasize estimation over hypothesis testing. We'd much rather say, how big is the effect? What's their confidence interval or something like that for the effect? And then not just ask, does that confidence interval overlap zero or not? Because that's the same thing as doing a hypothesis. But just saying, do we, does everything in this confidence interval give us an effect that's meaningful to the biological reality that we're trying to investigate? Uh, 
And if we think about things that way, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to um, capture the truth a lot more easily. And we should support, as readers, pre-registration. And by this, I mean, if you saw that somebody pre-registered a hypothesis, you should think more highly of that paper. They did science in a better way, and, and um, it, it should count more because it's more likely to be true. Being true is what we're after. What do we do as authors, as individual researchers? Well, we should, I think, change our priorities. We should do maybe fewer studies, maybe in collaboration, but we should be doing larger studies, with larger sample sizes. A lot of small studies do not add up to the same information quality as one large study. Right? That we know that from the publication bias literature. We should be willing to replicate important results. We should be willing to let other people, help other people replicate our results. Um, we should show the magnitudes of estimates that I was just talking about. We should practice open science. We should archive our data. We should archive our coding scripts. Uh, we should pre-register our hypotheses, et cetera. And lastly, the fault of publication bias ultimately rests with us as authors if we want to do something about that, we have to individually do that and make sure somewhere that it's accessible to others, make sure that we publish our negative results. Right? Doesn't have to be in science, but make it findable by future meta-analysts. Okay. And finally, what can we do as a community? Well, again, we should encourage pre-registration of hypotheses. Right now, that's not readily possible in our field to do neatly. We should work on that. As a field, we should reward replication. If somebody replicates an important result, that's probably a bigger contribution to science than something novel that's not as interesting as that important result. Right? I mean, even forget about how interesting it is. If something's worth doing once, it's actually worth doing five or six or 10 times. And we should reward each other in our assessment of each other for doing that. As a community, as journals, we should insist on effect sizes de-emphasize p-values, um, in part because it gives us a clearer idea of what's going on, but in part because it makes it accessible for future meta-analysis in a way that a simple p-value doesn't. We should reward error checking. Right? right now, if somebody takes the time to check, if I download this data, can I get the same answer as the original? Uh, we should not view that as the, as the editors of a prominent medical journal did as data piracy, we are data, they call them data parasites, I guess. We should reward that and embrace the fact that we know there's mistakes and it's a valuable part of science for somebody to help find them. And as a community, we should encourage more open science. And so I'll stop rather, by, well, I'll end this part by saying, you know, science works. We find stuff out. We learn things about the way the universe works. But we do it together, we do it sometimes in fits and starts, sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. Science works, but it can work even better. And if you'll allow me, I just wanted to say, uh, when I was first asked to be, uh, to run for president of, of, of this great society, it was right about when my um, supervisor, Dave McCauley, passed away. And um, as I was preparing this talk last week, he, Dave always talked about a, uh, Academic Father's Day, how we should always, uh, and so I just wanna thank Dave prominently for being a wonderful advisor and a wonderful human being, and uh, thank all of you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. I can take questions if you want, but feel free to go um, get your donuts and uh, make sure you get to the next talks. Yeah. yeah, Mark. What, uh, the question was, what's the explanation for effect size being smaller in subsequent studies? I think it's simply that if you get a large effect, it, it makes it more exciting and novel and interesting and more likely to be published in a high-profile journal like Science or Nature. And so uh, somebody else might have done that study and it turned out to be a middling effect that wasn't that exciting and, and it wouldn't have been in Science or Nature. That's conjecture. <laughs> 
Absolutely. So given publication bias, is there any concern about using meta-analyses? Absolutely. And, um, uh, what, uh, yeah, you should take meta A good meta-analysis should include an analysis of the likelihood of the publication bias. A good meta-analysis should um, especially uh, include a consideration of the differences between large and small studies, and, and, and they typically do. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a panacea, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't automatically get you the right answer, and there's many meta, there's, there's good documentation that I didn't have time to talk about here of how uh, about a third of meta-analyses have clear evidence that there is publication bias affecting the result in an important way. Having said all that, it's still, uh, it, it's still our, 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 our best path forward that I know of. Yeah. And, and I would go further and just say, you know, if you see a funnel plot, just zoom over to the right-hand side, and that's what you should be paying attention to, and don't, don't look at the noise. Yeah. Hi, Ruth. Right. Yeah, Ruth's point is that as a culture, we've converted quantitative findings into binary findings by, by embracing the p-value so over much. Yeah, absolutely. Carl. Uh, like, um, Right, that, that's a real concern to me. That, so the, the, the question was that, that uh, or the, uh, Carl's point was that uh, anti-regulatory groups have taken these kinds of challenges to the, the process of science as a, uh, as a way of saying we don't have to pay attention to science when, when we make our regulation, paraphrasing correctly. And uh, that's a real concern that people look at these kinds of uh, navel-gazing, that's the wrong word, but this, this introspection that we should do about doing science and, and uh, that it can be misconstrued. And, and so my response to it is, we, it's the hallmark of science is that we challenge ourselves and learn what we're doing wrong and try to do better about it and that we replicate it and we, we, we check each other. And that's, that is science and it's what sets apart science from any other way of knowing that, that, I'm, that I'm aware of. And it, it's actually the strength of us that we can talk about what goes wrong. So that's, um, yeah, so science is good. It just, it, 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 every individual bit of it doesn't get it right, that's all. Yeah, Sam. So Sam quotes somebody who can mark taper, saying that we we should be comparing models by perhaps a likelihood approach, and that solves the Harking problem potentially. I'm not sure that's true because it's 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 not just two models that we're dealing with. It's often many, and it's often ones that we haven't thought of doing before. You look at the data, the, the however you analyze it. If a particular analysis is, or a particular hypothesis and therefore a way of analysis is suggested by your interaction with the data, you're much more likely to test a hypothesis that matches what you saw. And, and therefore the p-value or any kind of analysis does not carry the same meaning in terms of their relative likelihood, their relative um, probability, or, uh, or the p-values. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is there, some, is there a Bonferroni correction or something that you could do uh, to correct for harking? In, in principle, maybe yes. I mean, you're doing a, a number of analyses. Uh, one of the, the minor challenges that those different analyses are not independent in the way that the Bonferroni assumes, but that just makes it more conservative. Uh, 
the, oh, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, the, the, um, that's the minor problem. The major problem, though, is it, I think it's very difficult to actually know how long is the list of potential alternative hypotheses that you really did consider. I mean, the problem here is that you look at the data, you see a pattern, and that pattern suggests a particular hypothesis that we then are very good at, te we're good at telling stories, we're good at coming up with a narrative that, that makes sense of the world, and we automatically do that when we see a pattern in the data. And if you don't see a pattern, you're, you're not, you don't have a list of the things that you didn't test. And so I, so I don't think it is actually possible to do, other than pre-registration or acknowledging that it's exploratory, which I think is to totally fine. All right. Thanks, everybody.